Just put Please this um, give a warm round of applause for Crystal. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Yeah? Good? Had enough to drink? Awesome? That's good for me. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, because this is the first time that I've spoken in Sydney since I moved to Australia about eight months ago. And the whole process of moving has been full of new learning experiences. Um, some of those things are the kinds of things you expect to deal with, right? Having to sort out where to live or public transit. Um, and then, of course, there's always a number of things that uh, are unpredictable that come up, like having to, for me, having to deal with capturing huntsman spiders. Uh, this was the first one I captured, but since I am terrified even of photos of spiders, I had to draw my own rendition on top of that. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure this technique of capturing them is old hat to some of you, but it's still new to me. Uh, and yes, so moving, it's a process of acclimating to a new place and learning about it. And that's why it's fitting that tonight I'm here to speak to you about user onboarding. It's that process of acclimating a new person to a product or service. Yes, onboarding, that thing that we design or maybe that we're exploring because it comes with the promise of carrying our new users, oops, carrying our new users upwards on the path to retention and engagement. And at some point, we'll decide, hey, let's design onboarding. And we'll start conjuring up images welcome screens. And we'll ask ourselves, how should we begin with a new user? But I want to start tonight by thinking about the end. Not the scary imminent end of things, luckily, but the end of onboarding. And specifically, I want you to be thinking throughout this evening, where does onboarding end for users in my product? Let me share with you where I used to think onboarding ended. It was with a screen like this. How many of you have seen one of these screens before? It's a you're all set screen, yep. Comes up after you set up a piece of software or maybe a piece of hardware or device. And in my first tech job, I was responsible for creating setup wizards for printers and copiers. I know, real exciting stuff. <laughs> but I was dedicated to perfecting that setup flow. I would spend weeks illustrating steps like how to connect cables to the back of your printer. And I would design a beautiful, you're all set screen, wishing people and their merry futures with their new printer, assuming my work was done. But as eventually I got into the world of app and product and website design, I realized that that approach didn't scale. That in fact, for a lot of people, the end of setup marked the beginning of their true onboarding experience, not the end. And so that's why I want us to think about that question because I've found that when most of us set off to design onboarding, we focus so much on solving the beginning that that's all we build. And we end our onboarding experiences too soon, typically, with the first run experience. And it's tempting to do that, right? Because first run is a dedicated moment in time, something we can guarantee all new users will see at least some part of. So if we do it really well, maybe we can point to it as a beautiful standalone piece of work in our portfolios. And don't get me wrong, those first impressions, they are critical, but designing onboarding only with first time use in mind comes at the expense of that long-term support you need and you end up funneling all your resources into designing something akin to a new hire's first day of orientation at a new company, right? It's a single event, it's presented in a one-size-fits-all manner, and therefore it can really only achieve short-term logistics, like getting people to sign paperwork. But true onboarding is about so much more. It will support customers through multiple events in their journeys through our products, it will provide diverse methods to suit users who are in different situations. And all of that so it can kind of blend in to long-term guidance in our products. After all, retention and engagement, those are long-term goals. So we should be trying to get users beyond those short-term logistics. Tonight, I'm going to help make the case for designing onboarding with longevity and give you some insights and tips that will help you make the case back to your teams as well. So let's dig in a bit more and understand those multiple events over the customer journey when onboarding can come in handy. And we'll start this section with a little bit of an activity. We have a small enough room, I think, where this will be successful. 
I want you all to just shout out a word that comes to mind when you think of what onboarding's job is. Right? Shout out first thing that comes to mind. Clarity. Clarity. Climatize. Okay. Education. Education. Cool. All right. I'm hearing some words, some of which sound like familiarize. That's great. That's definitely one of onboarding's job. It needs to familiarize someone with a product or service. But as some of your other answers started to allude to, it has other things it's responsible for. It needs to learn about a new user so it can tailor an experience around their needs. It needs to convert. That means maybe getting somebody to subscribe, sign up, or make a purchase, right? Usually that's tied to our goals. And it also needs to guide them to success and their progress to becoming retained and engaged. This is an insurmountable list of to-dos if we only give onboarding the narrow window of first run in which to do them. And that's something that good employers recognize when they design new hire onboarding programs. They plan activities in terms of months, not minutes. MIT's new hire program, this is their worksheets here, they show that they have activities planned from the first day all the way to the six to 12 month mark. And while we don't necessarily have to think as far out as 12 months when we're thinking of onboarding, we again need to think about unconstraining it so it can have more time in which to do its work effectively. So let's look at an example of that put into practice. Here's how Lumosity, a brain training website, onboards users beyond the first run. They start off with three interactive starter games aimed at familiarizing people with their process of training mental skills. And this includes teaching them about each of the skills that are being trained, the mechanics of playing each training game, as well as summarizing, recapping the skill that was trained at the end of each of those games. And these games are used in order for Lumosity to learn about the user's current baseline scores. I was pretty terrible at color matching in my first round. I had a wonderful 19%. Um, but these baseline scores are what help Lumosity start seeding in some information about its subscription plan to show how it can help them improve those scores. And while their goal is to get people eventually to subscribe, they've rightfully plan that people will not be ready to subscribe after the first use. So they have some tactics in place to handle that. The next day, if you haven't subscribed, they will send an email recapping the prior day's scores and encouraging you to take another day of free training. Upon subsequent days where you've completed more free training, they'll continue evolving the messaging on their recap screens to give you more and new information about how they can improve your scores if you sign up. And all of that, again, is aimed at getting you through that conversion step. But even after you do subscribe, they don't stop these things. They continue engaging you. So immediately after signing up for a subscription, they engage you in three games that you've unlocked by signing up. And other parts of the interface continue showing you more things that you can unlock with repeat engagement. And another thing that you may have noticed throughout some of these examples is how often Lumosity reiterates the skills it's training. Because it knows that in order to motivate you to return day after day, you have to understand the importance of what you're learning. And that's probably because they also know that if you learn something just once, you're up against a steep forgetting curve. This is a real curve discovered in the 1880s by German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus, who found immediately after you learn something, you begin forgetting it. And after one day of exposure, you're lucky if you remember one third. I know, that's, uh, that's not necessarily the most motivating thing. However, Ebbinghaus did find that you could hack this forgetting curve by repeating exposure to the same learnings if you distribute that exposure over time. And in the teaching world, this is referred to as spaced repetition. In the product world, it's all about needing to reinforce core concepts and actions to maximize retention and help build routines. And it's another great reason why onboarding needs more than the first run in which to be effective. And all those techniques that we looked at for new user onboarding aren't just limited to the initial onboarding of those new users. 
they can be effective at other points in the customer journey. For example, they can enhance the experiences of maturing users by creating an environment for continued learning and discovery of features. Here's an example from Etsy. They recently introduced to their sellers a feature called Pattern. It allows sellers to create a custom design for their shops. And so they had an element that encouraged them to opt into the feature and would engage them in a bit of a mini onboarding flow. First, importing their shop items into this new feature area and using that area to familiarize them with what they could do and guiding them through the process of picking a theme, previewing how that theme would look with their shop items, and then trying to get them to convert to a state where they have signed up for a free trial so they can try it out for themselves. Onboarding techniques can also help if you redesign your product in such a way that core workflows might be altered for existing users. When the Google Drive team had to migrate users of Google Docs to Google Drive, they found that a lot of these kinds of techniques were necessary to help minimize that aversion to change. And they captured this in a white paper called Minimizing Drive Aversion for the Google Drive launch. Um, that probably was presented a few years ago at uh, a few IXDA events here in Sydney. Um, but a lot of the things they talk about in best practices are similar to that best practices we've talked about for onboarding. Things like needing to familiarize people with an impending change or to guide them through the differences between old and new and to learn from them by soliciting feedback about what they could improve for the final version of things. And onboarding can even help if you have users who are returning from a long lapse of use. For example, sometimes long lapses in use are a natural part of your product's usage cycle, like how people only visit tax preparation software once a year. Yes, these techniques are helpful here too. In this scenario with TurboTax, I'd return to it after a long year of non-use, and it takes a moment to familiarize me with what had changed from the version I was used to using last year, and also takes a moment to learn what had changed in my own life so it could update its recommendations. So onboarding techniques are not limited to new users. They can be helpful at multiple events across the customer journey. And by visualizing and understanding these when you start designing a new user onboarding program can allow you to create guidance that scales beyond first use. And when you do start digging into the details of designing, even for just new users, my biggest piece of advice for you is to start at the end. That is to understand what core use should look like in your product. What is it that retained engaged users are doing every day? Because once you understand that, then you know what the desired destination is for your onboarding experience. And from there, you can work outwards to understanding all the routines that need to support core use and backing out from that to understand the constellation of key actions that might need to be highlighted as part of onboarding in order to bridge someone from their entry point to those supporting routines. It's almost like trying to draw a solution to a maze. Sometimes it can be a bit easier to solve if we start at the end and work our way out to the beginning. So we understand now that multiple events across the customer journey can be influenced and benefited from onboarding techniques. But the other thing we need in order to build onboarding with longevity is a diverse approach so that we can support users who are in different situations. And that's because the path to onboarding and learning in general is not a fixed one followed the same way by every person. You may toil away on a perfect onboarding flow between point A and point B, and you'll quickly find person one needs a lot more support than you planned for. That person two breezes right through. And maybe that person three, they like to take a roundabout approach to things. And that's okay, that's natural. These paths vary because people have different backgrounds, expectations, and just different preferences in how they want to take in new information. And what teaching experts remind us is that people just learn new material best 
when they encounter it multiple times and through multiple modalities. That's great for us because we don't have to waste our time trying to find the perfect single onboarding experience that works for everyone. It just means that we invest a little bit of time in building a diverse toolkit of onboarding methods. So let me walk you through five categories of onboarding techniques that I've found can make up a good diverse toolkit. The first category is defaults. We want to have a strong foundation of default experiences so that we can communicate to people implicitly about our product when they see it for the first time. For content-focused experiences, it's all about the information architecture. This is a website. It's called The Perspective. It claims to offer two sides to every story. And so the way that they've organized content on this site and presented that organization implies this purpose without an explicit onboarding flow needed. For more task-focused experiences, then it's really about leveraging those empty states. This is a product called Airwander, and it helps you find a stopover point between two travel points. And so it starts off by showing you the skeleton of information that you need to provide in order to activate the ability to select a stopover. And default settings can also be powerful. As Jared Spool found uh, when he studied users of desktop computers, less than 5% of those people may ever change their default settings. And so for us, what that means is if we have a strong set of defaults, if we pay attention to this when we're designing onboarding, we can really set people off on the greatest path ever. But if we don't spend much time thinking about this, we could be setting people up for failure. So we need to have this as a strong foundation first and foremost. Once we have that foundation, then we start adding in other categories of guidance. Things like inline guidance, when we weave education into the flow of surrounding content. <clears throat> Here's an example from Nextdoor. This is a community feed website and product. And someone here has just created their profile. And now the product is offering them a couple other steps they can take to further flesh out that profile. But they dock that checklist at the top of their community feed so that they can scroll through, read some of their neighbor's comments before coming back to this when the time's right for them. The third category of guidance that's really good to think about is reactive guidance, when you show something in response to user action. This one I like because it embraces a very learning by doing approach. Here's an example from Google Drive, and someone has dragged files from their desktop over the web client. And this little reactive hint appears from the bottom, reminding them that as soon as they release these files, they will be uploaded to the folder in view. And what this is, is a great example of informing someone who wasn't familiar with this behavior without interrupting someone who already was familiar with it. Now the complement to reactive guidance is well going to be proactive guidance. And this is when you are presenting something in advance of anticipated user need. And this typically takes the approach of something a bit more prominent and directed. But I don't want you to start envisioning giant overlays and takeover screens and that sort of thing. That's not how I want you to think of proactive guidance. When it's done well, it will feel like a natural extension of the product it's a part of. This is an example from Duolingo. This is a language learning product. And someone here has just selected the language they want to learn. And the product is now proactively trying to steer them down one of two paths, either to take their first lesson or to take a placement test. And it does this so it can, as quickly as possible, get people into its lesson training tool, the thing it knows keeps people engaged. But once you're in this tool, you can exit out at any time and just sort of poke around the ambient state of the product. But by proactively trying to steer you in that direction, again, they're trying to start you on the right foot. But not all proactive guidance will be that upfront and prominent. It can also be more supplemental. This is an example from Evernote, and this is a proactive tip that's appeared pointing out new feature integrations. 
But what's nice about this one is that it doesn't block interaction with the rest of the screen. You can continue typing, it might dismiss itself, but it's not being interruptive. It's just supplemental. And of course, when we're thinking about proactive guidance, we should be thinking also about our notification strategy and our email strategy. Those typically behave in a very proactive manner. So when we're thinking about balancing things out, make sure you account for those as well. And finally, no matter how much we might try to anticipate what users need, we will inevitably miss something. That's okay. That's why we need to round out our onboarding toolkits with a good centralized approach to on-demand help. <coughs> that means pulling together all the ways someone can go and seek information on their own, whether that's search of your articles, videos, connections to customer support. Put that in one place and make the entry point very clear. Even better if you can point out the entry point as part of their initial onboarding experience so they know where they can go if they have additional questions. So an effective onboarding toolkit will be comprised of more than one approach. And by having these different methods, it allows us to have backup solutions for whenever something doesn't go quite as planned. For example, if we look back when we were checking out that Etsy pattern feature integration, here they have an inline element trying to encourage you to onboard to that feature. But if you ignored this or otherwise dismissed it, there was also a, another entry point in the default state of the navigation menu. So in this way, you're allowing multiple onboarding techniques to hand off to one another so that onboarding can behave less like a rigid path that everyone has to follow and more like a compass that takes people in these different situations to the same destination. And while it may seem like a long list of things that we have to do and categories we have to do, chances are you already have what you need that you don't have to do a lot of new work. And so my advice to you there is to just run an audit. If you haven't already cataloged a lot of your product guidance or education, this is a great opportunity to do so. Pull together everything you can identify as guiding users and then compare and check to see that everything is kind of working cohesively. And that's because we can and should use diverse onboarding methods, but only if everything feels like they're working on the same team. As soon as you design an ad hoc solution, or drop in a third party plugin, you disrupt that harmony, right? And that's when users feel annoyed or confused by your guidance and it will render it completely ineffective. So aim for that cohesion across these different methods. So building diverse methods to suit people in different situations and supporting multiple events across the customer journey that's how you can help build onboarding with longevity. And that also brings us back to the question that I posed at the beginning. Where does onboarding end? What I want you to do with this question is bring this question back to your teams. Ask it any time you start discussing or working on anything onboarding or even user education related. Because this will spark conversation, get people thinking critically you'll quickly realize that everyone will have a slightly different answer to this question and that the answer will vary from product to product, <coughs> from user to user, from feature to feature. And that's great because it's those answers that help you illustrate to your team why we shouldn't be designing onboarding for the first run, but instead why we need to design it to carry our users for the long run. Thank you, and I think we have question time. Thank you. Yes, I've got a mic. And okay. you get to stay here. All right, great. And I can do that. And I'm looking for some questions. And while people are taking pictures, that's great. Because um, I, I had one while people are thinking about their <laughs> question. Um, actually, I have, I have a ton. Uh oh. Um, one thing I was thinking of, about was micro-onboarding, mm -hmm. for want of a better term. Um, I just made that up, but maybe it is a term. <laughs> and so with that, because a lot of people think about onboarding is we have a product and we're onboarding, but there's actually lots of elements 
of products and the larger a product is, the larger a service is. Absolutely. You have that, that mix of um, onboarding. So what kind of, I guess, ruler do you put against the amount of effort, the amount of task of those different onboardings? Yeah, so when it, so is the, is the question more around the rigor expected of users or the rigor expected of our teams? What would you rather hear my oh, you viewpoint? Ask yeah, I'm asking your question, question back. So, sorry, try again? <laughs> uh, so you asked what kind of level of rigor we should expect or, or put into it. Um, is it how much rigor we expect of our users or how much rigor we expect of our so teams? Probably both, but yep. I'd probably okay. start with the user because yep. they're the one you have to answer first. Yep, um, so that's a great question. So obviously, uh, you, you might have seen like throughout there's this illustration I have of a bit of a hill, right? And it keeps kind of like graduating up. Um, the first time someone comes to our product, they might have a bit more of a blank slate. And so you're going to, maybe not expect, but you're going to spend more of your time and effort building an experience that really gets them integrated into your product and makes them feel a part of it. As you go along though, it's very important to remember that people will create their own sort of baseline understanding of your product. And so you shouldn't go into every new feature you're onboarding expecting people to kind of go backwards and relearn a bunch of things or try to tell them things they might already know. My approach is to typically assume, is to assume that people are typically very smart and they have more knowledge than you think. So if you think something needs to be explained in a certain way, I would ask yourselves, how can I actually just assume they have some understanding and expect the bare minimum of them when I try to onboard them to this feature. Uh, it should always feel like kind of like you're demanding less and less of their time to onboard them to new things. And again, just assume people are smart by default. I think the, the onboarding experiences that tend to fail, whether they're for new users or for existing users, are the ones that expect everyone to start from zero and you know, learn from there and that everyone needs to start from zero. Does that help answer your question or? Yeah. Yes. Yep, cool. Hi, Chris, how are you going? Good, how are you? Um, great presentation. Um, I have a question about how you decide on the default. So basically, if you have a number of personas and each persona wants or needs different features and then it's not as, easy as going if I or B, you've usually got a lot of personas to try and cater for and you have overlapping requirements or features on that onboarding journey. How do you decide to go, okay, we're going with this particular profile? Yeah, so that's a tricky question because it, it I'll, I'll kind of come back to um, a statement I made earlier about dependencies on information architecture because ideally the structure of your product or your site is and, and the people that may need to use it is reflected by that. So, uh, you know, when it comes, again, when it comes to sort of those content focused ones, you might have different personas land on your product or your site or in your app and they're all trying to get to a different content it's really then about just focusing because like you said, there can be a lot of people to cater to. It's really focusing on having crystal clear navigation, um, content structure, that sort of thing. I think people underestimate how much that really is part of onboarding. Um, typically you see almost patchwork kind of laid on top of bad information architecture and content structure, and that's how onboarding gets envisioned, but it's really about that baseline and having it be solid. Thanks. Yeah, some, sometimes people just depend on onboarding when they haven't done this math decent IA. Yeah. Yes. And tell a little bit about the role of the onboarding in creating positive emotions towards the brand. Um, yeah, this is, um, this is an interesting uh, topic area because you balance um, so for, for anyone who uh, didn't hear, this is how do you use onboarding to create positive reinforcement towards a brand? And I think one of the biggest challenges, and I don't have one solid answer that's gonna solve every problem here, but one of our challenges with onboarding is what does the user want to learn and want to get out of a product? And what do we want to imbue them with as part of their process? And so I think right now we tend to skew towards, we tell them what to expect from our product and they hopefully take it in and that doesn't work like that. Um, that said, the, the 
strategy isn't just to then turn that off and, and focus entirely on like, let's user, let users jump in, use it, make mistakes, and we'll just sort of like follow them around with it. It's, it is a balance. So while um, maybe long ago I was more adverse to concepts of having any kind of screens or content that talked a bit about the brand and what to expect, that is, it's not a good way to teach people how to use something, but those kinds of upfront things, even if they're lightweight, can really set expectations about what is the brand, what is the mood of this product. So it is a bit of a balance. I don't think we've found that right balance yet. Yep. I guess I'm not in charge of the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's some back there. Okay. Um, how do you know, or what technique can you use to figure out that your onboarding is a bit of a miss and you're not, not hitting it right on at the time? Mm -hmm. the sort of feedback mechanisms. Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of things um, there. So obviously there's short-term things you can do, like you can get people into lab studies and you can learn about initial learnability. I don't tend to find that a great strategy to learn about onboarding because onboarding is a process and initial learnability is not necessarily going to help you understand will my onboarding process work. I've seen products with great initial learnability, um, and but you know people don't stick around. So it's, it's kind of a bit of um, like cohort analysis. So you look at users, uh, groups of users who are successful in, in whatever that definition is, and groups of users who are not successful, and you see what actions the successful ones had in common or what actions the unsuccessful ones had in common. And you sort of um, can see like, oh, actually we have a lot of people churning because they're all hitting this one thing or they're seeing my onboarding screens but they're not doing anything with them. Um, so th that's one way to do it. It's probably the best way we have. And you can couple that with diary studies and other kind of longitudinal qual stuff to balance out just the, the data that you'll get quantitatively. Um, you know, I think one of the bigger examples of this is uh, Facebook's friend, let me get this right, seven people in 10 days metric, uh, where they found when, when they were doing um, kind of cohort analysis a few years ago, they found that was the leading indicator of success. And so they had to change onboarding because onboarding was focused more on just like getting their profiles set up and it was instead steering them to try and do um, the, the getting uh, friends first and then worry about fleshing out a profile later. So that's the kind of thing I think that will help, will help with that. Sure. Yes, yeah. fellow with the hat. Hey Crystal, thanks for such an awesome onboarding lesson 101. <laughs> um, is it easy to break down those key actions into modules? Like is, is, that, is that a process that you go through? I mean, right, so I mean, I'm sure you know everything there is to know about everyone in this room and more. <laughs> um, is, it, is it easy to like look at those key actions and break them down into some formula? Um, so. Uh so I don't know anything about you. So that's my uh, that's my starting point there. Um, so specific to how I approach designing onboarding, which I can't speak for other teams. I know the approach I bring to things. Um, I do like to break down key actions. I have, if you follow the link also to uh, that's on the slide, you'll find kind of a further breakdown of how to break down key actions. Um, so I do modularize them, right? Because those actions, again, they need to be focused on action and to get away from creating onboarding that's just us telling a user what a thing should do or that you should do a thing, we kind of engage them with it. So it's almost like uh, creating a bit of a feedback loop. You have a trigger, you have kind of, and the guidance that kind of triggers someone to take action. You have any guidance around the action itself. So if we were signing up as a key action, that's the activity. You would kind of then layer in guidance that helps you through that process. And then there's a follow-up stage. And the follow-up stage is, is really key. That's giving you, you know, confirmation about what you just did, but it's also leading to any number of other key actions. It's really important for that to be the point at which we go, okay, yes, you've completed some step, but it's not in isolation. It goes to these other possibilities. Um, and uh, I should have added this to my appendix. I swear I thought like, yeah, I'll add this slide to my appendix and I'll do it. But, um, but yeah, if you, go, if you go to this link, you'll kind of see that broken down so it's not so abstract. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good. <laughs>
at Crystal Alley. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hey, Manfred. I know Manfred, by the way. I work with him, so <laughs> I'm just going to put you on the spot there. I was just wondering, are there any strategies beyond education or just simply providing information and in onboarding? Mm -hmm. So you, you mean anything beyond imparting uh, just kind of like straight up information? Yeah, it's really about the action uh, side of things. And so we kind of got into it a bit with this uh, this. Quick uh, question about the modules. Um, onboarding is as much about taking action and feeling something out for yourself as it is about uh, learning information. It's also through that action we can start to understand what is it that someone's actually trying to do. And uh, that's another kind of not often paid attention to part of onboarding. We're onboarding too as a product. We have to we, we are onboarding to understand the user, not just expecting them to learn us. Um, and I think, I think there will be, you'll see more of that now that we have you know, better models for things in the future. But I, I expect that products will get better about this and learning from users, not just telling them what to do. Uh, You're the timekeeper, so I'll I'm let the you. Timekeeper, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but we we do have a few more to get on with. A few more things to get on with. Sorry. Um, thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you.